Hello. My name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast reading series called Poets Corner, in association with West Words in Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see us sharing and a closeness of spirit. Each month, I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or so around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is Scott Patrick Mitchell, who will read poems and talk on the theme of addiction and recovery. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Scott Patrick is recording from Perth in Western Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging, of the Wellamita people the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and of the Wajuk Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land in Perth, and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Scott Patrick Mitchell is a Western Australian-based non-binary poet who is a guest on unceded Wajuk Noongar land. Their work appears in Contemporary Australian Poetry, the Fremantle Press Anthology of Western Australian Poetry, Solid Air, Stories of Perth and Going Postal. Their first full length collection, Clean, was published in 2022. A seasoned performance poet, Mitchell has toured Australia with works that have fused language and minimal Baroque to the 2015 one person showcased the 24 hour performance poem. They have won Cold Creek's Literary Award for Poetry, Melbourne Poet Union's Martin Downey Urban Realist Award, Poetry Award, and the Wollongong Short Story Prize. This year has also seen Scott Patrick receive the Westley Mid-Career Fellowship so they can begin work on their second collection and the 2022 Red Room Poetry Fellowship to work on a project called Antipodean Sea Garden, Knowing Perth Canyon. Scott Patrick lives with two black cats, Beowulf and Bones. Hi, Scott Patrick, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hi, David. How are you? I am well, thank you. I'm always well when I'm doing Poets Corner. Cool. Um, I look, I thought I would start by asking you, of course, a bit about your theme. Um, and the first question is, did you choose the theme or did the theme choose you? Oh, geez. Um, I mean, <clears throat> it's a bit of both, really. Um, so my collection, Clean, um, basically tells my story of living with addiction and recovery. Um, so yeah, I mean, I tell people I never meant to become an addict. It's just something that happened as a way to survive. And then it became a process of trying to get out of that. And, um, poetry sustained me the whole way through. So, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you a bit more about that later. Um, cool. look, we all, I think we all have some idea about what addiction means. Um, and there's so many different forms of it, and mm. it's all around us. Uh, but I, I've noticed that there's often a huge gulf between the people outside an addiction and the people suffering from, from it. Um, do you see your poetry as an attempt to bridge that gulf? Yeah, very much so. Um, very much an attempt to bring awareness kind of like to the chaos um, the hurt and pain that happens within it, but also holding space for those people who are outside of it. And so, um, yeah, so the collection very much is an, um, an emphatic attempt to hold space for both parties mm. and to not really judge or glamorize, but kind of just tell it like it, tell it like it was, tell it like it is. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, what do you think poetry can bring to conversations about addiction? Um, so I think it has this really unique ability to, um, because, so poetry is like opening up a portal and through that portal we get to experience empathy, intellect and awe 
and a whole bunch of other emotions. So by writing poems about my experience, I feel as though I've opened up a portal through which uh, people who don't have any experience or knowledge other than what they see in movies or in the media, um, they can gain an insight and an understanding as to the experience. Um, again, not to glamorize it, but just merely to create an awareness and a link, an empathic, empathetic link uh, with the reader. And, you know, to assure people that it can be harrowing, um, it can be a, a living nightmare at times, but people recover. And the book has a happy ending because yes. I'm here. <laughs> um, so people recover and it's important to acknowledge that, you know. So, yeah, it's very much about holding that space for both uh, the readers, uh, for those outside the experience and those inside. And also, I guess that inside every addict, there's a person. Yeah, I mean, completely. Um, ev exactly. Everyone. Yeah. That's it exactly, yeah. And it's always, it's always, um, it's always. I think people find it hard to remember that because the media does play a very big part in uh, creating villains, villain arcs, villain stories. Mm. Um, but yeah, within within every addict is a person. Mm. Mm. Um, John Kinsella um, at the front of the book described Clean as the book that the book that comes after and beyond Michael Dransfield's drug poems. Um, an interesting connection. Has Dransfield work been a touchstone for yours? Not really, not as much. Um, John's work has, but yeah. So I kind of came to Michael's work a bit later in the process. Um, I wasn't, yeah. I kind of just wanted to forge my own little path kind of thing. All right. Well, let's forge a path to a poem or two. Uh, uh, two. Okay. So I'm going to read two poems. So essentially, Clean is a book about love. So it's love for other people, love for family, love for drugs, uh, and then self care, self love. Mm. So these two poems, kind of like a, a mirror image of each other, and they appear right next to each other at the beginning of the collection. And they show the different sides of love. So the first poem is called Him, and then the second poem is called The Blood Thieves. And I'll read them one after the other. Him. Out farther, stars are the art in heaven. Hollow be the sky that does not contain them. Hello, be the aim of an introduction. Twine winged one, my heart is undone. We need to undress. We need to undress and press us into us. It will lead to temptation, which will quiver and upheaval. And our love will flower song immense in the face of the eternal. Forever endeavor to be a lover, a partner, a boy, a man. The Blood Thieves. When we were gone, we were an ache of poison. Gray, thin wind, erosion. We wanted to steal red rush of blood from their heads, make their health ours, dab, desire, pinch capillaries, a rouge robe lifting to the skin, paint borders beyond our own. Now you you mentioned that you you know these poems are related and you wanted to read the two of them together. Could you tell us a little bit more about the relationship of these poems to one another? So yeah, so they <laughs> so they both have this kind of religious element to them. So it was very much the first one is very much about kind of querying the Lord's Prayer and making it into something um, that you would recite to a lover. And then the second one takes on this kind of darker kind of religious tone and it kind of leans into, um, yeah, just kind of this kind of dark space that um, emerges in the first and second part of the book where 
basically you discover that it's two people who have developed a codependent relationship and they're leaning into each other. And it's this idea of it, this notion of us against them. Um, so when you are an addict in public spaces, all you want to do is disappear. That's all you want to do. Well, at least from, that was my experience. Um, and so it's very much when you have someone with you, it's this tension because you can't both disappear. And so it's this idea of just bringing the energy of other people into yourself. So it's kind of like a prayer and an anti-prayer. Um, but it also shows that kind of dichotomy of love and how love can become a little bit twisted. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I obviously you can't read that poem, the first poem without knowing that it's a, it's a play on the Lord's prayer. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and is itself a hymn and a prayer mm -hmm. and a plea. It's all of those things. Um, it hints at many things to me uh, at love and need and want and becoming and temptation and wistfulness. There's so much contained in it. All these things are, are part of life, but they're also part of addiction, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. Very, very, very much so. Um, yeah, and also, it, and that idea of commitment is also part of, that appears in the first poem, is also part of kind of, um, is also part of addiction because, you know, you, you invariably end up in the long game of it and, um just a case of how and when you escape <laughs> mm. but are you trying are you trying to give readers a sense of the complex emotional and physical swirl around around addiction um, not, a, not a straightforward thing is it no it's not a straightforward thing um i th i think i'm kind of signposting that you know there is this tension there's going to be this tension mm. um buckle up <laughs> <laughs> um so but it's also it's also i wrote that lord's prayer the hymn i wrote that as that was kind of like when i wrote that it was that one poem that has been anthologized a few times and so it's the one poem that i hope you know some queer kid in a high school reads and they feel seen and they know that there is a path there are other people who have been here before them and they're going to help. They're going to find a way through. And, you know, yeah. Mm. Um, it's, it's really interesting as a reader to read poems and sort of to glean, glean what I glean out of them, which may or may not be what you intended. <laughs> um, I just noticed that the opening words of each poem, um, Out Father and When We Were Gone, mm -hmm. both suggest distance. Um, and And... I was wondering whether they were a reference to how ad addiction makes you distant from others and also probably at times distant from yourself. Yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. So there, yeah, it's that idea of the, you know, you, so you can see when, when I was, when I was an addict, it was always a case of, I could see where, what it meant to be clean, where I could see that destination like constantly but it was just a case of how do i get there and do i want to get there um some days i wanted to get there other days i didn't but i could always see this kind of utopia this no place of being clean um and it was like a very far away dream so there is that distance that i wanted to create as well because sometimes the book really does draw you in <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the addiction, the addiction operates as a barrier. If you, if you, if you're wanting to disappear in public space, then, then there's a barrier between you and the, everyone else in that public space. Yeah. So yeah, very much so. Mm, wonderful. Next poem. Next poem. Okay. Um, so this is a bit of a, a slightly longer one. I'm just going to give a little story if that's okay for it. Yeah, cool. So just a heads up for listeners and viewers, this does deal with um, childhood abuse. So if you want to tune out, I totally understand. So one of the things, I did a lot of different therapies once I got clean to address a whole bunch of different underlying issues. Mm. And two therapists, both get, they're like two therapists from two separate organizations both gave me the same exercise once they found out I was a writer. And it was to write like a hero's narrative arc 
um, over seven parts. So this poem appears right at the beginning of the book and it pushes back against that therapeutic technique because it only tells it in six parts. The seventh part is the rest of the book. Um, so this is in six parts. Um, and the first, the title refers to mourning as in grief and sadness. The Morning Star. One. The first star pierces with dead light. Is a dirge. Is you. Is known by how it tugs, draws into sight, shall fill with shapes, how we monster a bed. Two, you are an ecological disaster. All your teeth are falling out because you refuse to speak, to shout. You fill your veins with swamp. Let your anger be the climate. Raging, become sea flood. Salt yourself. Let crystals sting as you rub them into your skin. Three, there is a man who claims to be your family. He teaches you to whimper with a full mouth. He will lay his hands across naked sheets, a stain remains, as does ink. Four, night was created so the gods had somewhere to hide their sins, their sins, their sins, and us made in their image, minus wing or cloven, Hoof, we follow suit. Five, at midnight, gather all your teeth and bury them at a crossroads, in a cauldron, in a coffin. Six, that first star, it can do nothing to save us from ourselves, from those men all ivory and ache. The first star weeps because to bear witness is a burden and we cannot sleep. Leave your body as ghosts step into atramentos. So this poem, in a way, was it inspired by those therapists or just a pushback? Yeah. A, inspired by and a pushback. Yeah, very much so. But also, you know, it was also, um, it also felt really important to write it and to acknowledge all of those parts, um, that kind of history that had happened. Um, yeah, and it felt important just to kind of have that there. But in part, it was also a pushback against that therapeutic technique because at the time that I wrote it, you know, there was still the idea of how how does the story end? How do you continue living with this kind of pain, with this kind of trauma? Um, and particularly when you're so focused on getting clean and um, being present within yourself. And then that's when I realized that the rest of the book was that final part and then yeah it's quite it's quite long <laughs> for a final <laughs> part but we never we never truly finish any uh, of absolutely. our stories no, or any right. of our poems uh oh, i'm really interested to know if the therapists have seen these this poem and what they think yeah i i did sh i did show one the last one and and she was like yeah, she was like, well, well, where, what is the final part? And I said to her, it's the book, it's the rest of the book. And she was like, oh, okay, that's quite clever. <laughs> I did do the, I did do the technique where I wrote the seven parts, la, 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 but I told her, I want to share this with you as well, because this is, yeah, yeah. Apart from the, the therapists, Mm. Um, I'm interested always in, in the genesis of poems, and I was wondering whether what came first, the epigraph or the poem? The poem. The poem came first. Um, and then, yeah, the poem came first. Mm. The poem very, very much came first. Um, and there was another poem at the time. I was writing this at the, other, at the same time I was writing another poem. And um, this one just kind of captured 
what it was I was trying to say without too much. Um, yeah. So, and it, it just it just became this real um, process, and then the epigraph found me afterwards. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, I guess my next question is sort of answered by that. I was going to ask, you know, poetry is very much about pushing boundaries, and I think, and and tackling uncomfortable or taboo subjects. Um, were you in some way drawn to write this poem because you felt that there was an injunction not to? What do you mean exactly by that question? Well, it's a taboo. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, people steer away from writing about some things, but you went yeah. straight into it. I went straight into it. Um, so, yeah, I, I like... I like that idea of, of writing about the taboo. So being somebody who is part of the LGBTI plus community, my community has for quite a period of time in history can, been considered as taboo. Um, and so I feel, I feel, and I feel like an affinity about writing about the, these kind of difficult topics because I, I come from a space where my whole identity, my whole existence is viewed by some people as a difficult topic. Um, so it kind of writing about this stuff, I mean, obviously it gives me strength, but I feel a bit more kind of um, ease of access, if that makes sense. I feel more of an affinity to write about this stuff because one, it's a lived experience. And two, because if I don't write about it, I can't expect anyone else to write about my experience. Mm. So, yeah, so there is, I don't know, Not the whole book isn't difficult, by the way, to anyone listening or uh, watching. I've, I've read it. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, it, there, it has a happy ending. Um, no, but it, it just, to start the book off, it felt like I needed to go into a space where it was like, you need to know that this happened. Mm. because this is what I've been working on for so long. Mm. Yeah. Then a, a related question. Um, poetry is also about bearing witness. Um, mm. How important is it to you to bear witness through your poems? Um, really important. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm drawn to poetry is because... Um, <sighs> You know, we're telling it. We're telling it slant, so it's not like, exactly. oh, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. You're able to pick out the angles and the shadow and the light of how it happened, and kind of give that as reference. And then the reader fills in the rest of the image. And yeah, so you're able to tell it and bear witness, but you don't have to be. Um, you don't have to be in the eye of the storm. You know, you can be part. You, yeah, you don't have to be directly in the middle of it. You can be all around it and within it and above it and below and tell it that way, which is why I like poetry. It's kind of like um, it's kind of a, an affinity between like a secret code and a magical language where once the reader reads it, they kind of invoke the spell of the memory. Wonderful. Uh, would you like to read another one? Yeah. All right. So we're still in the, so the book is split into three parts, um, Dirty, The Sleep Deprivation Diaries, and Clean. So we're still in Dirty. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, this is a, a prose poem called This Town. And just a warning that this does have a lot of imagery around addiction. This Town. This town is packed with fits and pipe dreams cracking. Here, the kids are addicts. They're folks too, in alleyways, syringes, scab, beer bottles, vulgar, the park. Sun churns bitumen as we burn from the inside out. Funny how this drug is anything but chill. A storm rolls into the curtains, threatening to arrive, but it never does. At least not in the sky. Black abyss eyes. You can tell the quality by the way some townsfolk behave. 
when the gear is good, they fight. When the gear is cut, burglaries go up. Then there are those who howl the night half naked, wrapped in winter's thrill, and each other. The cops are all exhausted. It's not just them. Those who don't use barricade bars across windows and lock cars for fear of cleaning up more shattered glass. Black abyss eyes eye you off how a snatch bag can fly. Those two days before Centrelink are bliss. Tension dissolves into sprinklers hiss. Summer heat induces sleep. Then they all powder keg their heads again. Vicious dogs, more vicious cycles more black eyes. After the third b &E, Mr. Patterson, he'd had enough, took a shotgun, blew up some dealer's house, two dead. That night at the pub, he was heralded a hero. The beer gunpowdered similar plots. A week later, the bikies moved in. Vigilantes quit the job before they even took it up. Mr. P, he's now serving life. And so are we. The cops are still exhausted. Nobody can sell up and cash grab, especially when you live four doors down from a meth lab. We learn to staunch as the kids become thinner and rabid. Yeah, it's very, uh, you're very there. <laughs> <laughs> the reader is very there, places very strong uh, images. It's hard to get out of your head once you've read it. Um, it is. It's a grim, bleak picture, which I suppose is what it's like from inside that place. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was particularly struck by the exhaustion and the black abyss eyes. Um, yeah. There is a powerful sense of resignation or hopelessness uh, that this is the way things are and there is no changing it. Yeah. Um, but I sense two that however much everyone is individually immersed in their own addiction yeah um, the exhaustion and resignation is shared and there is something communal about it are, are you alluding to a community of addiction and suffering um so i guess what i'm more alluding to so back in october 2016 um here here in western australia the local newspaper the west australian on the front cover had the headline meth city um and it, it kind of it kind of said it kind of acknowledged this kind of unspoken thing that had happened been happening in Perth for a very long time and he, as a result of that a lot of people kind of came forward and started telling their stories and uh, it was became evident that one of the areas in western australia that was really affected was bunbury and so the poem is an amalgamation of all of these. It's an amalgamation of like suburbs that I know, stories from Bunbury, and then this kind of kind of um, collective experience, you know, because Perth is still considered a bit of a, a town, even though it's a city. Um, and so it's this kind of bringing together of um, this experience that was happening at that time here in WA and just kind of bring it all together and it has this universality to it because it is you know it's familiar to a lot of people who have lived over here but it's also familiar if you've been reading if you've read any of the stories about the impact meth has had on rural towns and stuff like that so it was very much about capturing that and presenting it in a very condensed space so that the reader is instantly aware that of how addiction impacts the community. Mm. Mm. Um, in this poem, at least, there doesn't appear to be any way out, really. <laughs> <laughs> the pipe dreams, the pipe dreams, the pipe dreams, there's no way out there. Um, taking a shotgun and blowing up a dealer's house isn't a way out. No. Everyone's caught in the trap of addiction. How, how does an addict find the strength to break, break out, not just of the addiction, but of the community of addiction? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I was told very early on that you're only ever going to want to quit if you have that drive to quit. Um, and I was, I was in a very weird space 
in regards to that kind of idea. You're only going to quit if you really want to quit. And I was like, well, isn't me using drugs a cry for help? So that was me pushing back against that advice. And then all of a sudden, one day it just clicked. And it was like, nah, I, I, I want I want to get out. I need to get out. Um, and then it's it's not like a simple no. No. <laughs> it's the, it's a very kind of slow extraction. So it's obviously it's taking yourself somewhere safe, getting better, but then there's still so much that ties you back and that can draw you back. And so it's this real slow extraction of all of these different connections. It's a real process. Um, a real kind of labor, bravery, love, and grief. There, there was so much grief around getting clean um, that really surprised me and shocked me. But yeah, it's it's a hard road, but it's one worth traveling. Mm. All right. Uh, let's get on to some sleep deprivation. <laughs> no, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so do you want me to give background or just jump into it? Whatever you want to do. Okay, so the middle section of the book is called The Sleep Deprivation Diaries. Um, and it's basically as it sounds. So for those of you who might not be aware, methamphetamine causes you to stay awake for very, very, very long periods of time. So there was a point where I wasn't really writing much and I was immersed in this world and all I was doing was just taking journal notes and there was very abstract journal notes. And then I went back and I wrote the sleep deprivation diaries from it. Um, I'm really proud of this sequence. I'm only going to read day one. So the sleep deprivation diaries, day one. Am I imaginary? XX believes so, tells me as such. When her lover leaves, she summons me from across the mighty tundra. I appear. Banishment is never forever. As a hologram. Gems are made for this because jewels are her best friend, as are the imaginary versions of herself. From memory, I can remember how to do this vaguely. You may have one. I try to remember who I was and what that person would have done instead. But these rules, these rules, we make up. Someone just played shop. I made her happy, but not with love. With love, I buy XX. Odd little thoughts from the curios I find attractive. I am the fake. I am cold inside. Cryogenic Joan, somebody calls out loud, but not at me. Someone rings, I use my XX voice, the entire phone call. He loves my new mood, but I'm not her. I'm me faking her with expert precision. We love a little fakery. He asks me if I am wearing my F me boots and I lie and say, yes, of course, dear. Now what the F do you want? I call her XX because... I can't remember her name for legal reasons. One day might be enough. <laughs> um, how did you know when to stop? You've only got, you've got, how many days you got? You've got seven days. Seven. You could so, and interestingly, so day seven is actually an acrostic poem and it says sleep down the side of the <laughs> So you, you went to sleep and that was the end of the, these poems. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I really, I really like these poems. I had to read them a few times. Um, the narrator in this poem is asking the question from the outset, am I imaginary? And it's sort of a hologram. Yeah. Um, and the poem conveys a kind of flickering in and out of existence, really. Um, yeah. A vagueness and a tenuousness to identity. Is that a feature of addiction in your experience, that the addict, constantly shifts between states of being present and not being present yeah completely yeah it was very 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 much part of my addiction and then i because <laughs> i have a theater background as well so 
I would kind of slip into like alternate versions of myself and like um and I'd have I have a background in like drag and uh club theater and so I was always very happy to be very exaggerated or then just very obscure kind of weird niche thing and it was all part of this kind of um ongoing I guess psychosis of the experience was moving in and out of who I was and then adopting different spaces to find um, momentary sanctuary in those spaces and strength as well. Um, because the whole time that you're using, for me anyway, the whole time that I was using, it was this constant kind of barking of what I call my four black dogs. Um, these constant things and so as a way to dodge them you know you move into different parts of yourself lean into different aspects um and you know it sounds it sounds a bit weird and a little bit camp I think to some people on the outside um and probably not very healthy and it wasn't <laughs> doing drugs is not a healthy experience and it does kind of warp your perception of yourself um I think I was very lucky and blessed that I never went into um, kind of very overly uh, violent or criminal aspects of myself. But yeah, I always kind of lent into these slightly camp elements that, you know, part of who I am and would just be a little bit extra. <laughs> uh, that's just drawing on your own personas, though, isn't it? I mean, it's. Yeah. But, but uh, at some point, where is the fakery? And the fakery seems to be fairly central to it too. Yeah. So um, the fakery, I mean, it's just everyone's got their own agenda um, within the sphere of addiction. Everyone's got their own little agenda going on. So no one is ever really truly honest with themselves or with each other. Mm. And that for me was you know, the root of the whole fakery and everything like that. Mm. Um, the poem is about sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Um, <laughs> but it has the kind of jumbled quality of a dream. Yeah. Uh, which you held by that opening line, Am I Imaginary? Do you think there is a kinship between sleep deprivation and a dream state? Yeah, very much so. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons I personally you know, a lens into that space is because it had that kind of dream poetic quality at times. Um, you know, the grating harshness of reality was always there, but you could kind of push it away and um, play in this weird abstract space where, you know, really big thoughts were suddenly within reach and you could almost pull them into yourself. Um, but, yeah, I'm glad that you picked that up because that was one of the key central things of writing it was this kind of dream-like quality that does lean into nightmare and then pulls back. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's a long tradition in poetry and writing generally of um, writing whilst under the influence of something or other. Mm -hmm. um, I've never tried it really. Um, does it help your writing? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what it so what it what it I, it helps. I I I don't want to glamorize it in any way, but for me personally, it helps with ideas. It helped make connections that I never had. But the writing was always terrible. <laughs> um, and I I think there are literally only about two or three poems from this collection that are purely from that space. But the majority of them had to be edited and pulled into form and pulled and grounded and shaped and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. So, yeah, no, the writing is never good. The ideas are, but the writing is. And that's why this is all um, compiled from journal entries as well and then kind of stitched together. So I'm thinking this is a labour of love. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Very much so, very much so. Um, it was, it's, it, it's my story and I really wanted to tell it because, you know, one, it cuts out that entire awkward conversation. <laughs> mm. This is my past. Um, 
and two because I hadn't I wasn't really reading anybody else writing about it in this way and so I kind of you know I wanted to I just I, I wanted to tell my story yeah open a door and walk through it yeah 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 or like on the cover like push back the curtain um and <laughs> reveal you know the man the, the person on the machine behind yeah. <laughs> all right can you give us another poem please? i can so at the end of sleep deprivation diaries and it's perhaps i like this little poem and where it came from so towards the end of my journey with addiction i was just desperate to get out and um <clears throat> One of the few ways that I kind of, and I'm, I'm a very kind of spiritual and intuitive person. And so I'll always kind of rely on that energy wherever I can. And so one of the things that I did was that I realized if I kind of like invoked like a trickster element, I could kind of get out of the space. So I began writing a bunch of poems about foxes. Um, Cause I grew up in England. I was very familiar with foxes and how they could get in and out of, you know, places. And so I wrote these poems, and so this is one of them. Um, it's the final poem from the Sleep Deprivation Diaries. Fleet. Fox. Run. Fox on. The farmer's gun is sung. Cracks an opera across paddock. How it follows you home. Echoing. Faster. Red bolt of bush fur. Were creek on muddy paw. Your bloody roar, all tongue dry from panting vulpine firestorm. Contour horizons blue, emit smoke whimpers, a plume as this tail blazes behind you. Yeah, I love it. Um, I, I'm. I'm interested in the, the trickster. I'm interested in uh, the marriage in poetry between the conscious and the subconscious mm -hmm. and how poems might speak back to their creators saying more than the poet consciously intended. Is that something you experience with your work? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, it is a lot. Um, it is. Yeah, I mean, even just reading that now, like some of the images are like, oh. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is very much about leaning into the in intuition when writing for me mm. and then seeing what comes up. And then when you traveled on from that poem then stepping back and looking at it and going, ah, oh, okay, I was actually trying to process this thing that I've now been processing quite openly. Uh, and it's there. I can tell that it's there because of the symbols that I'm using and the energy that I'm trying to capture. Mm. And the tail blazing behind you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's tail spelled T-A-L-E. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tail blazing behind you. So it was very much, um, yeah, there was about a sequence of about three or four of these poems that I wrote just for me as a way to bring that escaping energy. And it, it happened. It worked. Well, mm -hmm. you know, it worked. I did it. I got out. <laughs> Um, you, you said before that not too many of the poems you wrote whilst in the middle of addiction really survived uh, unscathed. Mm. What's it like for you to read poems that you wrote whilst in the group of addiction from, from the other side of it? Oh. <laughs> um, it's a different kind of cringe. Um, <laughs> because, because there are moments in them, there are moments in them you go, oh, wow. That's really cool. That's amazing. And then you keep going and it's like, oh, yeah, you just kind of gave up here, didn't you? And you're just throwing as much sound as you can into the poem. Um, so, yeah, some of them I haven't I, – and I'm not, I'm not about to kind of get rid of any of them, hmm. but some of them do have these real flashes in them, these real sparks, and then it just, just turns into – something terrible <laughs> um 
And I'm also interested in the tricks to power. Mm. Can you tell me more about how you connected with it and how it helped you? Um, so, so the, uh, that kind of trickster element exists within the addiction sphere already. Um, you know, everyone has their own ag- agenda. Everyone being playing a part. Um, and then kind of just, it was just, it just felt it intuitively correct call on that energy. Um, because, you know, being, being queer, I felt like I was closer to it than most people might. And so it was just a case of just drawing it in. And it was also, there was a the kind of fear and trepidation about drawing it in as well, because, you know, when you're in that space, you know, there's so much that can easily fall into psychosis and, and, and noise just coming at you. So it was very much about focusing that energy and almost like sending a prayer out into the world. I think that was what it was. It's this, this kind of coded desire, sending it out and hoping, hoping that it would echo back to me. Um, I'm getting emotional just kind of remembering it, hoping that it would echo back to me and um, show me a way. And it did. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy path. I don't think it ever really is, mm. um, but it echoed back and it found me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I got out. Mm. Um, I really love the uh, the way you've got the title, Flea, and then the T in capital in, in, in brackets. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a trickster title in a way. It is. And it's playing on two things, playing on running away. Mm-hmm. And speed, yeah. Um, can you ever run fast enough to outpace addiction, or do you have to turn around and look it in the eye? You got to turn around and look it in the eye. You can try and outrun it. You can, um, and I, I think, for a percentage of people, there is a way that that is part of the process is outrunning it. Yeah. But there's always there's always a point where you have to turn back and look it in the eye and that is either to say goodbye to people or to confront the mistakes that you've made during that time um or just to acknowledge that no this is it this is the line that i'm drawing Mm. Mm. all right uh your next poem for us (laughs) okay so we're moving into happier territory. So, but the, again, this is just at the beginning. So this is the title sequence. I'm going to read the whole thing. Is that okay, David? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> um, so this is a longer sequence and it is in nine parts, um, but it's it's the beginning of the happy ending. <laughs> Clean. One. After one day, you still haven't slept wonder what you're doing with yourself energy grates grinding makes you death remember all poetry begins with the decision either to be read or to be written you are a poem from this an epic getting clean begins with cleaning so clean dispose of all sharp things responsibly replace with forgiveness two After four days, sleep has come hard. The majority of it you spent unconscious, so deep you left an indent on the other side of the mattress. Hypnos was glad you finally stopped by, took the time to realign, reshape landscape, let the crush of blanket be mortar, a foundation to vanquish. Allow ruby slippers to be stolen. Do not chase them. Red shoes make you dance until you're dead. Instead, remain buried you shall arise anew from this grave adorned in resilience due three after one week you still feel like shit this is your own fault please know this is not an excuse to return to what you've learned by rote instead drag yourself through the days fill veins with nutrients the stink of chemical out seep all else fails, sleep, 
you're getting really good at it. Or after three weeks, your dealer texts. They want to make sure you haven't died. Do not reply. They only concern themselves with your coin and addiction. Theirs is one of misery capitalism. If necessary, drink coffee to give yourself a kick. Those flashes of fun that burn in your brain, they shall haunt you for as long as you travel down this road. Remind yourself that these desires, they are dying. Let them. Sometimes death is slow and painful. Five, after five weeks, that money in your pocket shall yearn to be spent. Buy yourself books or a new look or more food to fill up the aching behind ribs. Replace all the things that Crystal took. Six, after two months, the color returns to the world, your cheeks. You are filling out forms as if ticking boxes for reassurance, all progress is progress. If your dealer calls, block them. You are touching the sun. Reward yourself with poems. Become addicted to something other than destruction. Seven. After four months, you will feel human. It is a path of calendar. The mark on your arm has lost that color, is no longer bruised. It is a reminder. Take each day in your arms, slow hug that last 24 hours. Be proud of small accomplishments like looking at yourself in the mirror without flinching. Muscle is taut, you ungaunt, make tea, smile softly. Eight, pink cloud, an apostrophe in sentence lifting. Five months on, heady moments of recollection. The body has memory, remembers, maelstrom. Nature is speaking clearer. Stones sing as they once did. Clear space inside yourself. There is grief encroaching. Your mother will forgive you. The city will too. Walk with them both. Watch as age takes hold, gain more weight. Shame is such a heavy, useless emotion. Nine, after six months, you will still be haunted, but at least you're clean. Now, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I just want to cheer after that poem. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> um, I wanted you to read the whole thing because there is, uh, in the reading, it became clearer, musicality. You've got lots of internal rhymes. Yeah. And it's very it's it's very subtle, actually. If you're looking at it on the page, you don't see it. But when you read it out loud, there it is. And it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a mark of poetry at its finest, I think, that you can incorporate that without necessarily people even noticing it at first reading. So thank you. Thank you. Um, it seems to me reading this poem, you've got this hell of a long journey um, to get clean. It's a tough process. Yeah. But you punctuate it with notes to self, you know, replace with forgiveness, you know, resilience, yeah. um, smile softly, all these things that you say to yourself, um, which in a way is kind of like the acquisition of wisdom. Um, it seems to me that, you know, if you get to the end of this road, you're not just clean, you've been cleansed. Um, do you think there is a spiritual component to the process of becoming clean? Uh, for me personally, yes, yes, very much so. Um, I, know, I know that there are um, organisations such as AA and NA who do very much lean into that. I never went into any of those kind of programmes. Um, I did this with the hard work of, me and a therapist in a room and confronting as all, all of all of the stuff that led to the point um but it became very much um just i don't know just an opening up of the soul a relaxing actually of the soul back into a space where it felt connected with uh the world with energy with other people um, because, you know, using it felt, you feel as though you're being kind of compressed and pushed in 
a lot of the time and you hold a lot so much tension mm. and so learning to relax again and it was also the soul and the spirit learning to relax and just to be um be able to breathe and be happy yeah um i've heard addiction described as a fog where thinking is difficult or disordered or distorted what is it like when the fog lifts oh what is it like when the fog lifts um so it's it's this interesting mix because there you realize that there's this carnage that <laughs> has been yeah, you kind of um you know there's this carnage um particularly with with uh meth um was very much realizing that yeah there was a lot of mess to kind of clean up um not only within myself but in re- regards to relationships and all of that kind of stuff and so once you start kind of dismantling that carnage and then putting it into places you know you realize that it has like shame on it that it was and there's a lot of dealing with those kind of sudden flinches of shame that come with cleaning up and um putting your life back together i think that was probably the hard part and i think that's one of the things that kind of still endures to today is that there will be sudden flashes of shame and it's like oh and it it, it, it it's um it's like a little mini kind of toxic shock to the body um but it's part of that thing of okay well what is the shame why is it there let's you know let's help it unpack itself and find a new shape hmm so it's more than just um confronting yourself and confronting the addiction you actually have to you have to have a look back and see what what happened that must be yeah oh it. yeah completely completely and you know some of it i mean some of it you can I see no you can't. I was going to say some of you you can turn a blind eye to but you can't. You have to you have to look. Mm. I had to look. I had to look at a lot of what I'd done and kind of make sense of it and not just go oh well I was an addict da, 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 da. no what was what facilitated me to be able to do that you know what was it. And mm. so yeah. Um you end after 6 months you will still be haunted but at least you're clean. Mm-hmm. Does recovery ever end? Does the no. haunting just stop? No. <laughs> no. Uh, maybe it does. Maybe for some <laughs> people it does. <laughs> but I think as a poet and, you know, us poets and our, uh, our kind of secret love affair with suffering, um, no. <laughs> I, <laughs> I um, yeah, no, I'm, there are still moments when I'm haunted by it. And it's hard because the body, the body never really forgets. Mm. So, you know, stuff, something might happen and then all of a sudden you have full physical recall of getting high. Mm. Um, and it's, it's disarming and it can happen sometimes. I've, the further along you get, the more you realize the triggers that cause it, mm. but it's when it happens it's still very kind of um disarming and not so much devastating but it has this it has this kind of um heaviness to it because it's like ah it still hasn't gone and i don't think it will because it's part of your story and you can't just turn parts of your story up i can't turn parts of my story up i wish i could if i could i would (laughs) flick the switch and get rid of that kind of haunting, but it's still there from time to time. The beautiful thing is that you're now going to tell us a little bit about joy. Yeah, yeah, because who doesn't like a little bit of joy? <laughs> so um, this is actually, this next poem is actually a pandemic poem, but it appears earlier in the collection because one of the things that happened with lockdown and all of that is that I actually, um, I actually had a lot of kind of like flashback to recovery and getting clean because part of, for me, part of the process of getting clean was this kind of shutting myself in and locking myself away from contact with people. 
Um, and so, yeah, so this is a kind of celebration, how joy arises. What are eyelids, if not parentheses? Open them. Outside, white cockatoos swirl, call magpies to bring their mat as crows crackle on the industry of him. The puncture of Venus is healing into blue as a body, celestial, rises. Stretch. Step out of bed. Wooden cradle ship. See how sand collects at the corners. Sheets lapping. Coffee sputters through the grind of a machine between ankles, cat threads to mule and meal, open phone, let news spool into view. Some will be the kind you really ought to sit down for, how knees know when to buckle. Acknowledge this and let go, because amid it all, there is hope. Give gratitude, send love, trust. With tender hands, we should use a word like prayer, and we have. Yes, it is another day like so many you have lived before, but you are here now. Indeed we are. Um, so I, I read this poem. Um, it's not hard to read it. Um, Scott Patrick, as a blessing. Yeah. And isn't it nice to have a blessing, blessing poems in a, in a book? Um, like this, um, it very gently leads us to be in the present moment, mm -hmm. um, which which is a place which is for ready ready for us whenever we're ready for it. Yeah, um, but it can be such a struggle to get there that it is worth noting and celebrating when you do. So thank you for that. Um, how hard one was getting to this place of joy when you can take joy again in the small ordinary. Oh easily overlooked things um how hard one it was it was yeah uh, and it, it, it's funny looking back because you're always hoping that maybe there was this one miraculous day when all of a sudden everything was just like ah but no it was it was just more of a incremental kind of realization that i'm here i'm here now and and i'm not you know 5,000 leagues ahead of myself and I'm not lost in some kind of dark room um and so yeah there were and it was interesting getting to the pandemic and to the lockdown and realizing there are the parallel to recovery um and then that was there, there was there was an opportunity to kind of um lean into and look back at that kind of reconnection, that pause, that being present. And um, I mean, I was, I was, even though the world was going to chaos during the lockdowns and all that kind of stuff, I was very, very grateful to be able to make that connection and find that space within myself. Um, I'm a bit of a fan for joy. <laughs> <laughs> It's always wonderful, but is it is it more wonderful when it has been inaccessible, and you yeah. found your way back to it again? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and yeah, it is. It is completely yeah. And just that kind of um, and just finding it in in the most surprising places. And then um, because I am a very kind of like emotional person, and kind of that crying with happiness was such a refreshing uh, place to come back to. Mm. You know, those tears of joy, it was just so refreshing to be there. And and I, it's, it's a space now that I, you know, openly embrace whenever I can. Um, yeah, because it was just, um, it's a revelation. It's an absolute revelation. It's this kind of high, pure, sharp C note and yeah, it just it kind of resonates through the whole body. The natural high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Natural high. Um, is it a little bit like um, reclaiming yourself, or is it 
are, are you even more joyous now than you were before? I think it's more reclaiming myself. Uh, even in addiction, there was joy, um, but it was always it was always slightly tainted with mania and and manicness. Um, so it, kind of reclaiming myself and just finding that kind of um, purity in it. And so that's such a word, strange word to use, uh, purity. Um, finding that kind of, um, yeah, unhindered quality to it. Mm. It's just more, more welcoming. It's not an enhanced joy. It's just no. A, it's yeah. it's not a grating joy, <laughs> which is what it was like a lot of the time. So it was always that grating sense underneath it all, mm. um, and that's gone, which is you know a revelation and and a blessing. <laughs> we take our blessings wherever we can get them. Yeah, um, exactly. And would you bless us with another poem, Scott? I will. So I am going to kind of, again, a little bit of a content warning. So on June the 12th, 2016, a lone gunman walked into a nightclub in uh, Orlando, Florida, and took the lives of 49 people, um, 49 members of my community, the LGBTI trade plus community. In the aftermath, first responders were attending to the deceased and there was a moment when all 49 of the mobile phones just started ringing at the same time. Um, so this poem is dedicated to those who lost their lives at Pulse nightclub in Orlando. 49 mobile phones. What is the sound of a kiss between a man and a man if your worldview perverts you from seeing all the lonely people where do they all come from? Here, Eleanor Rigby is a drag queen. Beetles bump beneath skin as bones bounce in ecstasy and Orlando is a woman who was once a man who is now a woman again. In musical theatre, it is perfectly the norm for men to dance a chorus line form. The same can happen in a nightclub, so come seek sanctuary. After all, closets are for lions, witches, and wardrobes. But him, that one whose name now gives him power beyond the grave and his legacy already stains rainbows, he is out to bang the cocked gun of being human and all the hate that that can bring. Hot damn. A screaming orgasm. Slippery nipples, sex on the beach, birthday cake, prairie oyster, rumple mints, an ice luge, gold clanger, Jägermeister, kamikaze, mind eraser, bombs. The three toed sloth. Boiler maker, fireball, flaming Lamborghini, chartreuse, schnapps, absinthe, absinthe, the sucking cowboy, the licking cowgirl. These are the only shots that should be heard ringing out in a nightclub. What is the sound of a kiss between their death and your living? 49 mobile phones ring out in unison uh we're living in a violent culture it's kind of all pervasive it's everywhere and it's hard to escape the conclusion that as a society we're addicted to violence yeah Is um part of what this bomb is trying to say or um i think more uh, it acknowledges that kind of addiction to violence but i think more so what it does is if this had been an experience that happened when i was an addict there would have been very very little emotional connect connection for me toward it mm -hmm. um because it would have just been another event in the news cycle and would have kind of disappeared in my you know just disappeared inside of me but being clean and then hearing this kind of news story and it being present and 
and having access to my emotions again in an unhindered way, this had such a profound impact on me, um, especially having worked in the nightclub industry here in Australia. And, um, you know, we always prided ourselves when I was working at the nightclub that the nightclub was this kind of sanctuary. And yeah, it got taken away. It got by with, with this, this event happening at Pulse, it got taken away. And so I included this poem just as a, a reminder for myself that my community is just so important to me. And I, I'm connected to quite a few different communities, but the main two are the queer community and the poetry community. And for this to happen, it was just um, profoundly shocking and heartbreaking. And yeah, I wanted to acknowledge that more than anything. Mm. And they're both global communities. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, both global communities. Um, yeah. Um, this is not sort of a question about the poem specifically, but I'm just wondering, once you have experienced the world through addiction, mm -hmm. the lens of addiction, do you see addiction in everything? No. No. I mean, no. Uh, I mean, uh, actually, that's, that's a really interesting question because I think you can see addiction in everything. And I think addiction is really, really tied into a lot of contemporary life so our use of social media uh this kind of weird um capitalist desire to buy 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 um you know so there is it is kind of really tied into a lot of how we live our lives you know but I kind of, I kind of have hope. <laughs> well. You want to, you want to resist that idea. I'm not a complete nihilist, not anymore. Anyway, I'm not a complete nihilist. I do, I, 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 I would rather see the good than the bad. I'd rather see the good first than the bad, and I'll, I'll acknowledge the bad. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, another poem. Another poem. Okay, so this one is for all the writers out there. This is like a little kind of tiny manifesto for writing, being a writer. On how to be a bird. Surrender. Give in. Have faith that jumping submission first will yield results. How else can a fledgling be expected to leave a nest? Disappointment is grounding success is callous you must catch every failure and then let them go from this process learn to treasure the shape of being victorious how like a cello with a note reverberating in its throat this universe is the hand guiding you to resonate orchestrate conquest not over others but the enemies within Doubt, doubt, doubt. Do not doubt yourself. See how even just then it begets itself. There are those who can assist you. Bend twigs like mother bird catches worm to dangle. Achievement is growing feathers. It happens with time. Soon you too will have a cap full of plumes, a head filled with wings, a horizon to fly into. Oh, it's a gorgeous poem, but you know, you've you've thrown me a bit because I when I read it, I didn't see how it was for writers. So what do you mean by that? So what do I mean by that? Yeah. Um so writers. So yeah, so I mean it's Ultimately, it was it was written for writers, but it can also it all, I can see how it also fits into the thing of. Um, so this was um, I wrote this 
uh, with Red Room, and I just done a series Red Room Poetry, and I just done a series of workshops teaching um, school age children about poetry and stuff. And I noticed that the one thing I was getting asked the most was, "How do I become a writer? How do I become a writer? How do I become a writer? Or how do I become a poet?" And um, it was really hard to try to communicate that to young people and so this poem came about because it was like well it's like being a bird you know you got you first got to get out of that egg and then you got to grow those feathers and then it's uh you got to jump out of the nest and then you got to fly and then it doesn't stop it's migration and all of these different parts and yeah, so I kind of wrote this just as a way to honour the inquisitive minds of school-aged children and also that kind of inner child of myself. This is, this is what I love about poetry, right? It, 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 it takes you places you don't expect to go. So here is my reading of the poem. Okay. Right? I read this where the bird is a metaphor for freeing yourself from the cage of addiction. Yep. I can see that too. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that too. Yeah. And it is. I mean, it works on multiple levels, which is what a poem should do, apparently. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Um, now, you talk about learning to treasure the shape of being victorious. Tell me about being victorious. Being victorious. <sighs> Look, it, I. In which which regard? In regards to writing or in regards to addiction recovery? <laughs> Take your pick. So in regards to writing, Victorious is just that ability to write a poem and you read it back and you still feel inspired by it mm. and it gives you that electricity, that kind of buzz. Um, in regards to addiction, it's that one day at a time. Um, um uh, yeah, it's that one day at a time. I think one of the first things that I ever taught myself about writing is that it's baby steps. So you just keep taking those baby steps when you're starting to write. You keep taking them, and then one day you're going to look back and it's going to be a giant leap. It's going to look like you've taken a giant leap. And that was what I lent into when I was in recovery was that it's baby steps, one step at a time. And then when you have the strength to look back, you'll realize just how far you've come. So it's really trusting in that process. It's and and yeah, just really trusting in the process. Um, I know for for my writing that some some poems, you never know this when you're starting to write them, but some poems kind of become a touchstone uh, mm -hmm. or a, perf a personal manifesto. Not not just reminders or notes to self but instructions for going forward um mm -hmm. does this what does this poem mean to you um it, it means a lot <laughs> um and it reminds me that it reminds me that people have, have asked me how how do i achieve what it is that you do and so it reminds me that I'm going to get emotional. It reminds me that no matter how many dark roads I've kind of gone down, um, people still kind of respect um, the journey that I've taken. And it reminds me that the journey has been hard, but the destination keeps on getting better and better and better. Yeah. You can't get to the destination without the journey. Yeah, exactly. And it's a constantly changing destination. Like I said earlier, no poem, no story, no journey is ever end finished until, but even then I don't think it does. Um, so it, nothing really ends. And so just, yeah, to be able to share my story and to have it connect with people, it just means a lot. It really, really means a lot. Hmm. yeah all right uh we've got two more poems okay well i was gonna ask david um can we make it one more poem when we finish with binding spell is that okay or do you want me to do two more it's up to you 
Can we do one more? So you want to start that again by saying we've got one more poem? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Scott Petrie, we've come to your last poem. Yeah. So um, I'm going to bring it kind of, um, gosh, how do I talk about this one? So uh, actually, actually, this is the poem that I was writing at the same time that I was writing um, the Morning Star that I read earlier. This is the other poem I was writing at that time. Um, so this is a magical spell, which is a bit of a little theme going through the collection. If you if you take the chance to enjoy clean. Um, so one thing that I will note, or well, two things that I will note, because I always get asked. <laughs> so the first one is um, I think it's you. Eukonite, uh, Unikite, Unikite. Unikite is a uh, crystal or gemstone uh, that is used in um, New Age practices to ward off addiction and the habits that come around it. Um, and then the poem starts with Sain, S-A-I-N, uh, and Sain is... Uh, a Celtic tradition equivalent to Native American smudging. So you take juniper berries and you burn them and you cleanse your body with it. Binding spell. Sane yourself. Create sigil from your burden. Write down the name and number of your dealers on a piece of paper, then delete from your phone. Bind using black thread. As you loop those who profit and loss, tell yourself ritual is a form of recovery. Thank your addiction for all you have learnt. Place in a jar with vinegar and spit, with wax, seal the lid. Bury this far from where you live. Travel the distance and all day ticket permits. A crossroads at midnight will work in a pinch. Or offer to the ocean, ask for it to wash your feet up all those paths that led to scoring. Turn skin into unikite. Rose hip shall knit scars, see tracks fade. Remember, getting clean is a form of grief, so let go of your own ghost, awake every day. Oh, I was going to ask you about Sane and Unicot. You, you stole my thunder. Um, oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we, we know, of course, with addiction, that there's always the prospect of relapse. Yeah. Uh, it would be great to have binding spells to prevent that. Um, is this poem kind of taking power to ward off relapse is, is it is a wish and a plea or, or is it something stronger um a wish or a plea uh it is it is um it's stronger than a wish or a plea it is it's a command it's it's mm. that kind of command um of breaking of breaking that <sighs> so one of the things that happens in recovery is that your thought processes uh, can get away from you and they can kind of bargain and negotiate this kind of path through to using again. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote this as a way to kind of stop that, um, you know, and the, 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 because the brain will work how it, how it wants to work. And so it will negotiate and it will go, okay, yeah, 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 I figured it all out. This is, so let's do it. Let, let's let's go back and use and it's like no mm. we're not doing that anymore um so this was that kind of command that kind of cutting that pathway um and saying no like you can no because that will lead to that and it's taking it far too many steps back it's not the direction that i want to go in so yeah, it was very much. This was very much a command. Um, I remember, you know, I've I've studied uh, like um, quite a few different uh, magical and spiritual practices in in my youth and uh, adulthood, and so 
it was kind of also acknowledging that part of myself that is interested and drawn to that kind of bigger space. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to tell us about your theme today? Uh, not really. <laughs> Just that there's a book that you can read it in, and like I've said, it's got a happy ending. Um, I don't know. Just, yeah, just that if you are interested, if you are a poet and you're a, um, or interested in writing poetry, remember it is a long game. It is a long game. And it's, it's one way you have to look after yourself and um, honor yourself. So, yeah, I guess that's it. All right. Well, I'm going to end with a comment rather than a question. Um, I mean, this last poem and the book ends with the words, remember getting clean is a form of grief, so let go of your own ghost. Awake every day. Now, Melinda Smith's described these words as an understanding of the true cost of everything. Uh, I read this book, the poems in this book, as a calculus of cost and loss, but they are also, I think, triumphant, arising from the ashes. Um, these disparities go hand in hand and are beautifully framed by the words awake every day, which references both the grief and the wakefulness that comes with recovery. So, Scott Patrick, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much for sharing poems and insight on the theme of addiction and recovery. Thank you for having me. It means a lot. Details of Scott's publications will be po posted with this podcast, so look out for that. Uh, we will return in September with Diane Fay on the theme of poetry as a pathway towards healing. See you then. <laughs>